Well, hello, everyone. My name is Mick Sullivan, and this is The Past and The Curious, episode 51. It's become a little tradition that we do. We've done four holiday episodes. Whoa, and I guess I would call this my fifth one. Uh, And we've settled into this thing that I really like where we tell the stories of some toys or, you know, some things that are very common in the lives of children. So today you're going to hear the tale of A.C. Gilbert, who invented many things, some of which were wildly dangerous. Uh, And before that, though, a really fun story that I have a lot of friends helping out with. It is the story of John Joseph Merlin, the man who is credited with inventing the roller skates. There are other versions of the roller skates that show up on the historical record before this, but it was a big moment for the roller skate, and it makes for a really funny story, too. You're going to hear, in that story, my friend Scott Moore made some amazing music, more about him at the end, and friend of the show, Scott Alsup, all the way from Romania by way of England, Uh, and so much more stuff. Mr. Eric's going to be on the show, but we got to get started, so let's go. In the 1830s, a brilliant English mathematician named Charles Babbage would dream up the analytical engine, which most people agree was the first automatic digital computer. Famously, his friend Ada Lovelace was considering Babbage's computer when she published what was basically the first computer program. Now, the actual computer wouldn't be created during either of their lifetimes, but their well-planned ideas were enough to change the world. And don't get me wrong, you wouldn't have been able to play Minecraft or Among Us or even Solitaire on a computer like this or anything, but it was a pretty radical idea. And like many young people who go on to do great things, Babbage was inspired by some pretty creative people. One man in particular comes crashing into mind. When he was a young boy, Babbage's mother, wishing to nurture his curiosity and fascination with mechanical things, took him to visit a short, older, and quite unusual man named John Joseph Merlin. Now, if you live in England and your name is Merlin, people might expect you to be some sort of wizard. And while this Merlin couldn't cast spells or shapeshift, and he had certainly never counseled any mythical kings like King Arthur, he was a wizard in his own ways. By this time, he was approaching the end of his life, but he had remained pretty famous around England for decades. You'd have a hard time finding a man who had created quite so many unusual inventions, and you'd also have a hard time finding a man who knew how to make an entrance, and get noticed in quite the way that Merlin could. First off, he was an inventor of automata, but he was also one of the most prolific inventors in all of Europe. If you've listened to our episode, Mechanical Monsters, you probably recall the basics of what goes into an automaton. If you haven't listened to that episode, well, it is our most popular episode, so consider this an invitation. In short, An automaton is a mechanical device, often resembling a living creature, which through gears and finely tuned pieces can create movements that mimic something like life. Think of it like an early robot. They were wildly popular at the time, and they didn't even really do anything. They were just, like, cool to look at. In some ways, people never change, and they love a good amusement, and automata were the pinnacle of impressive amusements in the 1700s. One of Merlin's earliest creations was a collaboration with a mentor of his. It was called the Silver Swan. And unlike many of the automata from the 1700s, this one still works. The shiny silver swan bobs its head on its long neck, cranes over its shoulders, and ultimately catches a fish, which it appears to swallow before nestling back into its wing. To watch it now and consider all of the mechanical movements and all the time spent making each articulated piece is still amazing. In the 1700s, it would have been mind-blowing. And these sorts of things did blow Babbage's young mind. During this visit, the world changer to be saw some of these Enlightenment-era robots, but also saw invention after invention, mechanical curiosities, and some of Merlin's favorite creations, musical instruments. It was obvious to Merlin that this boy showed an aptitude. He dripped with potential, and he burned with a desire to understand more. So, the man suggested to his mother that they all visit his private workshop, 
which was not something the general public got to cast their eyes upon. This must have made quite an impression, because years later, after Merlin had passed away, his collection was sold, and the now adult Babbage bought a few of the eccentric man's unfinished automata and finished them himself, in sort of a tribute to the genius who showed him kindness and knowledge at a young age. Of course, this meeting was towards the end of Merlin's life. When he was a younger man, he wasn't so famous, and he didn't have a museum filled with his creations. But he knew how to get where he wanted, and it began with getting noticed. John Joseph Merlin was a Walloon. Calm down. That just means he's from Wallonia. And Wallonia, of course, is a French-speaking region of Belgium. After studying in France for a while, he settled in London, where he worked as a clock and watchmaker. And eventually, he became a mechanic for another man who taught him the finer points of automaton creation. Despite his pretty, humble, Wallonian upbringing, Merlin made friends with some impressive people, and he always had a drive to be the center of attention. He also had a love of music. He was a good musician, and he would later create some remarkable musical instruments. Sometime around 1760, he would have been about 25 years old, and at this time, he would have also been very hungry to get noticed. High society was tight, and it was tough to crack. But it was the Enlightenment era, a time when new ideas, math and science, rational thinking, and understandable creativity was very important to people. And Merlin was good at all of those things, but he was also good at getting noticed. Flashy clothes at a dinner party go a long way. Having a pocket full of curious creations in those flashy clothes goes a lot further. But Merlin took it further than that even. One night in 1760, he secured a coveted invitation to the Carlisle House for a soiree, a fancy party to say the least. The mansion was owned by a wealthy woman who had once been romantically involved with the very real man named Casanova. She was an opera singer with a taste for fine things and lavish parties. She actually got arrested once because she was having opera performances without the proper license, which I guess an opera license was a thing at the time. Seems kind of silly now. Anyway, he devised a plan to make sure every single person there, and there were hundreds of people there, every single person there noticed him. He had a goal to be well known, and he saw the party as an opportunity to work towards that goal. He had come equipped with a violin. That was no big deal. Violins were pretty common. In fact, there was a small orchestra of musicians playing in a very large room at the party. The room was about 90 feet long, in case you were wondering. He had also come equipped with something new that he had recently created. There were actually a pair of things. Some wheels mounted to two platforms that he could attach to his feet. You and I would call them roller skates. With the party in full swing, he strapped those skates to his feet, put his violin to his chin, and started playing with the orchestra while rolling steadily across the huge but crowded room of partiers. As more and more people watched him roll by, the room fell into a hushed silence. He continued playing his instrument, and the crowd stared in rapt curiosity. It was only a matter of seconds that it must have taken to get across the room, but it probably seemed like an eternity. But here's the thing. Merlin was a great inventor, and he liked to take risks, but he might not have thought this situation through completely. Merlin never figured out how to stop on the skates. So when his 90-something feet of space ran out, it was an incredibly valuable floor-to-ceiling length mirror that would bring him to a halt and leave him in an injured mess on the floor, surrounded by the splinters of his violin. Really, his goal was to get noticed and have people talk about him, so, you know, mission accomplished. A musician who witnessed the event gave us this great summary that he wrote years later. One of his ingenious novelties was a pair of skates contrived to run on wheels. Supplied with these and a violin, he mixed in the motley group of one of Mrs Cowley's masquerades at Carlisle House. 
When not having provided the means of retarding his velocity or commanding its direction, he impelled himself against a mirror of more than five hundred pounds value, dashed it to atoms, broke his instrument to pieces, and wounded himself most severely. Luckily for Merlin, things went up from there. And you might be surprised to learn that he still got invited to parties. At another one many years later, he would make the rounds at the masquerade in a chair on wheels that he could propel himself. It was an early version of the wheelchair. Merlin had a passion for music, which led to him creating a device which would attach to a harpsichord and allow it to function more like a newer, very desirable pianoforte. If you don't know what goes on inside of a harpsichord, just know that it doesn't work like a piano. When you hit a key on a harpsichord, a series of mechanisms engage, which results in a finger of sorts plucking the string inside the instrument. There is no dynamic control. That's very important. There is no dynamic control. What that means is that if you touch the key ever so lightly, it sounds like this. And if you were to hit the same key with a hammer and all of your strength, it would sound like this. There is no dynamic difference. Every keystroke sounds the same in volume. The pianoforte which is basically what your idea of a piano is today, changed all of this. There are soft, tiny hammer-like things attached to each key, which will hit the strings inside differently, depending on how hard you press the key. With this newer instrument, you can play soft, you can play loud, and you can play in between. In fact, the word piano actually means soft, and the word forte means loud so you can see why the pianoforte wound up with the name. He also invented a piano that would notate music you played onto a piece of paper. He invented new types of organs and piano combinations, but it wasn't all music. He invented a foot-powered Lazy Susan that allowed a host to fill a dozen or more glasses without getting up or even reaching. He created an accurate set of scales that would fit into someone's pocket, which was actually a big deal at the time and quite a commodity. He invented mathematical instruments and new types of clocks, all of which young Charles Babbage would have been amazed by. Before he died in 1803, there was one more major Merlin invention that made the news. It was a horseless carriage. Taking it for a spin around London, the would-be wizard sat inside the beautiful buggy with the controls to steer and propelled it himself with a windlass which was a crank-powered machine that turned the carriage wheels. And yes, he learned his lesson. He put brakes on it. It's time for You Have 30 Seconds, and it's Max from a submission from a while back. Take it away, Max. Very interesting stuff. Hello, my name is Max, and did you know there was a prison island that was said to be inescapable because of the high security and frigid waters? But in 1962, free people escaped Alcatraz. These free people were John Anglin, Clarence Anglin, and Frank Morris. They had constructed rafts made out of raincoats and drilled holes in their walls using drills made out of a spoon and a vacuum cleaner. They successfully escaped Alcatraz, and, and to this day, they have not been found. Oh, such a cool story. Thanks for sharing, Max. Someday I'd like to go to Alcatraz. I've been to San Francisco, but I didn't go to Alcatraz. I don't know why. Anyway, thank you. And if you have a you have 30 seconds that you would like to submit, then there's instructions on our website. Have a crack at it. It's a lot of fun. All right. Um, what comes next? It's quiz time. It's quiz time. It's quiz time. Time, time. That's right, my friends, it is quiz time again. Question number one. What popular toy was invented in 1943 by a man working with springs to try and keep sensitive equipment steady at sea? Trying to keep those devices steady in the rolling waves, Richard James experimented with mounting these devices on several types of springs. Once, one fell and then slowly walked down the unlevel floor, and the slinky was born. Question number two. Another toy invented by mistake. Which toy was created, also in the 1940s, as a potential substitute for rubber?
Rubber was created from natural substances found in certain trees, but there was a shortage during World War II, so scientists tried to create a synthetic version. One failed attempt became Silly Putty, which someone had the brilliant idea to sell in a uh, batch of Easter eggs that they bought very cheaply. Silly Putty, by the way, is a non-Newtonian fluid and bounces very high when thrown, but if you hit it with a hammer, it can shatter. Okay, question number three. What's brown and sticky? <laughs> a stick. A stick is brown and sticky. <laughs> that one always kills me. But it's not just a joke. The stick was inducted into the Toy Hall of Fame in 2008. It makes sense, as many people believe that it could easily have been the very first toy. Anyone who has ever seen a young child playing with a stick should know that it can be just about anything. The mark of a good toy is one that makes you use your imagination, and a stick does just that. Once upon a time, there was a man named A.C. Gilbert, Alfred Carlton to his mother, and A.C. to his friends. But the letters A.C. might as well have stood for always creatin' because this guy put together quite a career of imagining, realizing, packaging, and marketing popular gifts for children in America. It all started in 1907 when he sold some of the very first magic kits on the market. You've seen something like these, a handful of moderately rewarding and often confusing tricks and illusions that are packaged in a box kit, along with a basic manual and probably a magic wand or something, so that kids can learn a few tricks to amaze their family and friends. Soon after he made these magic kits, he had another great idea, a bona fide million dollar idea, which would also be his most enduring gift to children. I'll tell you about that in a second. But with magic kits and a million dollar idea already in his pocket, you would assume a man like this would take a break. But no, remember, this is always creating Gilbert we're talking about. As you'll see, he worked all the way into the middle of the century. Things were very different by the time he and the rest of the world reached the 1950s, which was towards the end of his career. But he was still very ambitious. World War II had happened, and people were intrigued and terrified and curious about atomic energy and all of the things that science was dreaming up, which was a lot. Space was calling, new inventions were being created every day, chemical discoveries were making lives easier, and every country was working hard to be a world leader. Many believed that America wasn't going to have enough future engineers, chemists, or scientists so A.C. Gilbert created an entire line of toys to get kids excited about these things. In retrospect, they may have been the most dangerous toys the world has ever seen. And we'll get there too, so hang tight. Alfred Carlton Always Creatin' Gilbert was born in Salem, Oregon in 1884. Early on, he developed a fascination with magic. Performing magicians were wildly popular throughout the 1800s, and A.C. definitely got caught up in that excitement. And as a young man, he caught a bunch of other people up in it too, because he himself became a very good magician. When it was time for college, he considered hanging up the rabbit and hat while attending the prestigious Yale University, which sat all the way across the country in Connecticut. His plan was to be a doctor. Nothing really kept him from achieving that goal. His grades were great, and he had an aptitude for medicine. But he just couldn't quit the magic bit. The passion worked out well for him, actually. He paid for his own expensive Ivy League tuition by earning money as a part-time magician. And passions are just that, passions. He loved magic, so when he considered the ample money he was making by the time he graduated Yale, he figured he'd pause the whole doctor thing and keep abracadabra for a while at least, to see where it led. It probably wasn't what his mother wanted for her little Alfred Carlton. She probably would have preferred a Yale doctor to a magician, but sometimes the magic life just chooses you. But this was important because life as a magician gave him a close-up view of people's appetites for illusion and leisure domain, which is a fancy word for sleight of hand. Though he often warned, don't try this at home, he realized some people, especially kids, might actually like to try it at home. 
So that's how he got the idea to package the kids' magic kits for sale. Thus began the first creation of many creations he'd always be creating. And he formed the Misto Manufacturing Company, which would lay the groundwork for the rest of his life. The magic kit sold well enough to pull him away from magic performance and push him towards the toy business. Of course, real magicians were not happy about the kits. A magician is never supposed to tell their secrets, and the kits certainly violated that magician's code. Maybe AC figured if a magician couldn't tell his secrets, he could still sell his secrets. This all happened around 1907. The next year, in 1908, he took a break from work with Misto to travel to that year's Summer Olympics in London, England. And wouldn't you know it, AC won the gold medal for pole vaulting. Turns out, AC could have also stood for Airborne Competitor. It's not like he just joined the competition and won. He had been a high flyer in college, and even held the pole vaulting world record for a period of time. In between pre-med classes and money-making magic engagements, he propelled himself into the air at increasingly great heights. Maybe the air up there helped him think, because he landed back on the ground with more ideas. While riding a train to a meeting in New York, he had the greatest idea of his life. New York in 1912 was a gigantic industrial metropolis that was constantly pushing the limits of engineering. Everywhere you looked, the eye was met with a wondrous futuristic mix of steel beams and cast iron fixtures, many of which were held together with giant bolts and screws. This really got his gears turning, and cables stretched overhead and in much of the city, including the railway that was carrying him to his meeting, they were converting to electricity. He watched the workers running the electric cable on giant steel girders that were made from smaller pieces bolted together. Immediately, the idea formed in his brain to make an engineering toy for kids. And as soon as he got home, he and his wife were spread out on the floor and the kitchen table, cutting cardboard models of his idea to run tests. The result would be known as the Erector Set, a toy that would sell millions and millions of sets over the decades. If you're not familiar, the Erector Set comes with a bunch of metal parts in several sizes, real bolts and screws, and in some cases, even small motors. It gave budding engineers the opportunity to build things like miniature buildings, those girders he saw, functioning mini Ferris wheels, automobiles, or anything else they could imagine with the provided parts. It wasn't the first construction-based toy, but since it was metal, customizable, and required tools, it felt very real, and as a result, became very popular. It was a perfect toy for the time, and it made A.C. Gilbert an important figure in the toy industry. Just a few years later, however, in 1918, America was deeply involved in World War I. The country was struggling to supply troops who had been sent to Europe. Materials were needed, and factories were required to make those materials. Non-essential items were on the chopping block, and in the fall of that year, the government decided that toys were not essential. More so, the materials and the factories where toys were made could be useful to the war industry. To the sadness of many, these governmental grinches shut down factories like Gilbert's. But a group of toy makers got together and sent AC to speak to Congress. He defended the need of toys for children, and among many things, he said, America is the home of toys that educate as well as amuse, that visualize to the boy his future occupations and start him on the road to construction and not destruction. He showed examples of the toys that they were keeping from the market and said, not only were these construction toys valuable learning tools, but they showed the long-term effects of fostering inventiveness, creativity, ingenuity, and problem-solving abilities. The government Grinch hearts grew three times that day. Turns out AC could have also stood for, All right, Christmas! Because that year, he became known as the man who saved Christmas. The government changed their grumpy minds and reopened the toy factories. Now, Let's not ignore the 800-pound gorilla in the room, which is that his statement was solely focused on the needs, creativity, and potential of boys. While it was a common thought at the time, that doesn't make it right, because, well, it's not. But more on that at the end. After this, AC's company experienced years of growth and expanded into many things, including trains and microscopes and more. 
but sometimes the decisions they made were hmm, questionable when it came to safety. Remember the need for scientists that we mentioned earlier? Well, AC dove headfirst into that. Perhaps AC could have also stood for adolescent chemists. When you think of chemists, you might think of test tubes. You know, those glass vials that stereotypical scientists are always mixing their chemicals with. At the time, it was a required skill that chemists know how to make their own test tubes. So AC debuted the Kids Glass Blowing Make Your Own Test Tube Kit. The big problem here was that it required kids to work with molten glass. And glass melts around uh, 1000 degrees Fahrenheit. So... no. But that's nothing compared to his full-blown chemistry sets. For a few short years, $50 could buy you the A.C. Gilbert Atomic Energy Lab. A.C. Gilbert Atomic Energy Lab. Atomic Energy. Including not one, not two, not three, but four different types of uranium ore samples. And here's the thing, uranium is highly radioactive. It's used to make nuclear weapons. So it's not really a good thing to play with, you know? But if that wasn't enough uranium for you, it also came with a Geiger counter, which is an electronic device that measures radioactivity. And a guide to mine your own uranium. AC could have also stood for atomic children, it turns out. Obviously, this kit did not last long and it's generally remembered as one of the most dangerous kid toys of all time. Luckily for him, his legacy is more commonly remembered as the creator of the Erector set and the man who saved Christmas. It's a shame AC didn't stand for all children, because he should have known that all children, every boy and girl, had the potential to benefit from science and engineering-based toys. He clearly left girls out of his speech to the government on the benefit of toys. Of course, there's another famous engineering toy company who apparently has always had a more enlightened outlook on the use of toys. Just a few years ago, a parent opened a box of Legos that had been unopened since the 1970s, and inside they found an unusual statement printed on the back of the instruction sheet. This person took a picture of it and shared it on the internet. It was so unbelievable to many that a company would say something like this in the 1970s that a lot of people thought it was fake. As you know, a lot of fake things get shared on the internet. So a bunch of research went into seeing if this was real. And it was. Here's what the letter from Lego said. Two parents. The urge to create is equally strong in all children, boys and girls. It's the imagination that counts, not skill. You build whatever comes into your head the way you want it. A bed or a truck, a dollhouse or a spaceship. A lot of boys like dollhouses. They're more human than spaceships. A lot of girls prefer spaceships. They're more exciting than dollhouses. The most important thing is to put the right material in their hands and let them create whatever appeals to them. People simply couldn't believe that a company would advocate for equality back in the 1970s. Turns out though, they did. It was real and that's awesome. Mr. AC, always creating abracadabra, airborne competitor, adolescent chemist, atomic children, Gilbert, did a lot of really cool stuff. But he could learn a thing or two from this letter. Well, all right. First, I would like to thank Scott Alsup, Mr. Scott Alsup, Mr. Alsup History.com is his website. Um, it's a great site. He's a history teacher. Um, he also has a podcast called History Pod, which has been on for a long time, and I've been a subscriber for years. It's actually a daily podcast. You, you can find out something quick that happened on this day. It's one of those sorts of things, but it's audio. It's really great. Um, I appreciate him being a part of the show. I've been meaning to make him a part of the show for a long time, so it was great. Um, I also, and you can find those links on the website too. I also want to thank my old friend, Scott Moore. Uh, he did the arrangements and the performance and the recording of this, the orchestra from the Merlin piece. Um, Scott and I have played many gigs through the years, some really fun ones. Um, and he wrote a little note that I think is really cool. I think it's super interesting. The orchestra music that you heard is a rearranged bit of the first movement of Sonata Number no. 2 for harpsichord or piano forte with an accompaniment for violin or German flute, Opus 16 by Johann Christian Bach. It was published sometime around 1779. And Scott notes that it seems 
Johann Christian Bach was no stranger to Carlisle House, where the famous mirror incident took place, being that he was among the set of prominent musicians engaged by Teresa Cornelis. So even though this piece was written a few years after the heyday of Carlisle House, uh, we both like to imagine that J.C. Bach might have been on the bandstand the night that Merlin had his skate with Destiny. And I have seen many sources stating that those two men did have a relationship and were friendly, maybe even like really good friends. I also need to thank Mr. Eric from What If World. Always a treat to have him on the show. And if you don't listen to What If World, I recommend it. It's one of my faves. All right, now Patreon people. Holy cow, there's a lot of you to thank which is awesome. By the way, all you Patreon people, if you didn't know, or if you want to be a Patreon person, there's actually a, a bonus short that I just posted on there. So if you're a Patreon person, go find it, listen to it. It's actually about the history of Play-Doh, so it's pretty good. Okay, let's get started. First off, I need to apologize. Iggy, I'm sorry I missed you. Iggy, Yay! yes, thank you very much. Yeah. And Happy New Year. I also need to thank Emerson and Grant Daly. Emerson, Emerson, Emerson and Grant, Grant Daly. Oh, and look, Logan, Lucas, Ella, and Eric. Logan, How's it going, Lucas, y'all? Thank you very Ella much. Hope you enjoy the show. The Bishops, thank the you to Bishop. the Bishops. Also, Maeve and Peter. Maeve and Peter. Yeah, thank you, Maeve and Peter. Uh, Xander Bloom. Xander. Xander, thank you so much. I'm glad your ears are out there. That's a great name. Henry and Charlie from Waltham. Henry. Or Waltham or Waltham. I don't know. You're Charlie. probably from the Northeast. So it's probably Wal- Waltham. Waltham. Henry and Charlie. Uh, Tanya and Carrie. I think that uh, you probably wanted me to thank someone else besides you. So if not, thank you, Tanya and Tanya. Carrie. And if it's Carrie. not you that you want me to thank, then let me know who I should thank. Oh, there's a song coming up. So don't turn this off. Also, I need... To thank Molly and Molly Remy and for Remy. the lovely card that you they guys. sent to me. Awesome. And I also need to wish a very special birthday to Ben. Ben, happy birthday to you. Your parents were so thoughtful and they we, we set this up back in November. So I hope you have a happy birthday. Uh, I also have a son named Ben who has a December birthday as well. So, you know, we have that in common. Okay. Uh, I think that's everything. If I missed you, I'm sorry. Tell me because there was a lot of people. But I have one song. For the Harrisons. So, Harrisons, I hope you enjoy. For everyone who's not a Harrison, well, they have a family motto that says, hiking is not optional. So let's rock. Hiking is not optional. Harrisons hike, whether you like it or not. Hiking is not optional Harrison's hike whether you like it or not Happy New Year, everybody. My name is Mick. This has been The Past and the Curious. We'll talk to you in 2021.